We're here in John 17 this morning. Uh, We began this series of messages from John's Gospel back in January of 2019. And with today's message, we are now entering into the final stretch here, if you will, the final stages here of this series of messages. I hope to complete this uh, series in the next several weeks. We skipped over the last uh, half of chapter 13 through chapter 17 in order to preach a series of messages around Easter time dealing with what happened to our Lord in John's Gospel. With the understanding that we would come back to this, uh, these chapters, and so today I, I want us to do that. I want us to take this 17th chapter of John's Gospel and devote some messages to it. There's a lot in here like we've seen in chapters 14 and 15 and 16. To finish this, and I'm sure there are several, more than the few messages I plan to preach from here in John 17. Now, I, you've noticed probably I've not been in a hurry to rush through John's gospel. I haven't for the simple reason that, that I feel very unqualified to deal with this great gospel. This is a powerful, powerful gospel with so much in it for us as believers. And as I look at these first few verses of John 17, I feel like a man who's got too much stuff to, to put into his suitcase, to stuff in his suitcase. But then it occurred to me that John chapter 17 is a chapter that no pastor and no theologian and no Christian can really deal with adequately if he does not have a sense of awe and wonder upon his heart. And I hope that as we come to this chapter 17 that we will... Uh, not be so concerned uh, about all the details and interpretations of those details that we lose this sense of awe and wonder about John's gospel. So today I want us to look at these opening verses. Would you stand with me as we read aloud from John 17, verses 1 through 5. John 17, verses 1 through 5. Jesus spoke these words, lifted up His eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son also may glorify you, as you have given Him authority over all flesh, that He should give eternal life to as many as you have given Him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Would you bow and pray with me, please? Lord, we thank you very much for this privilege to stand before your people in your house on your day and open your word and hear the truth because every time we look into your word, we see nothing but the truth. All your word is true from start to finish, first to last. Thank you for that, God. Thank you for the confidence that gives us that we can always trust what you say. Would you help us to see here today, God, what you're saying to us through your son, Jesus, as he gives these words of comfort to these men on this night before he's arrested and betrayed and crucified. Words that comfort them and comfort us even thousands of years later. Lord, this is a marvelous prayer you've laid out for us here. Would you help us to see it, even as we just get started here today? Would you help us to see that there's things in here for all of us as believers, and there's things in here for us if someone's here and they're not a believer, they're not a follower of Christ. We pray for your Holy Spirit to speak to their hearts as well, as we ask all of this to be done for your glory's sake, as your Son said, for you to be glorified, Father, for your Son to be glorified, for your Holy Spirit to be glorified, as we pray all of this in the powerful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And all God's people said... Amen. You may be seated. There are phrases here in these first five five verses of John 17 that you're going to be wondering about, and I hope in due course to be able to deal with those phrases as you look at them. But I'll not be able to deal with all of them today. That would take quite a while to do that. So before we look at these verses this morning, I, I want just to remind you a little bit of where we've been in John's Gospel over these last few years. And I'm not trying to give you a complete review because you know we had a couple months off there with the virus last year. We take time off of Christmas to do other things. But we've covered about 20 chapters up to this point. I want to remind you of the theme of John's Gospel that we started out with back there in 2019 and the basic division of the Gospel of John. The theme of it is stated there in John chapter 20 in the last couple of verses. Would you flip over there a few chapters to John 20? Look what John writes in verse 30. 
John 20, verse 30, And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of His disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in His name. This is the theme of the book. John says He's written these things that we may believe. And the phrase there is not just an evangelistic intent. As some people say, the Gospel of John is all about evangelism. And certainly, John cared about lost people coming to Christ. No doubt about that. He was always eager to win lost people to Christ. But the writing of this Gospel is to professing Christians, people who do believe already in Jesus. That verse 31 there that I read you has the force of it when he says, I am writing these things that you may go on believing in who Jesus is and what He's done. John was concerned... So he wrote in a way that he could see among professing Christians what was going on in his day that I brought out to you in the first sermon in this series of messages on this gospel. He could see many professing Christians in his day having the same problem we're having today, and that is Christians with dwindling faith, faith that is shrinking and getting smaller and weaker. Folks, I don't see our days as days of great faith. I don't see our days in the, in 2021 as days of great commitment and connection to the Word of God and to the Son of God. There have been many similar, similar periods in history like this before. This is not new in the history of the church. When the church has been feeble and frail and apathetic, when she seems to just be plodding along somehow, John is facing a time like that in his own day here. I can imagine that old apostle sitting there in his home saying to himself, what's wrong with this modern generation of Christians? What's wrong with them? Why is there such dwindling faith today? And folks, look around, we could say the same thing. Why do so many people have no interest in the things of God? None. And then after reflecting on it a little bit, as it, with his years with the Lord Jesus Christ and walking with Him and what he'd seen Jesus do and heard Jesus say, he finds himself saying, oh, if only these Christians today who are so apathetic, who are just stumbling along and just going through the motions, could see what these eyes of mine saw, if they could just hear what these ears of mine heard, and oh, the things John saw and the things John heard. He saw Jesus stand there at the tomb of Lazarus. Folks, we talked about this. That man's been dead for four days, and what does Jesus say? Roll the stone away, and he walks up and says, Lazarus, come forth, and the dead man comes out. Remember that? John saw that. And when Lazarus was carried out, bound in hand and foot, Jesus said, loose him and let him go. And there in John chapter 5, he talks about how he saw Jesus heal the lame man who'd been lame for a long, long time. And then in John chapter 9, he heals a blind man who's born blind. They've never seen anything like that before. John saw these things. These men were healed by Jesus Christ. John could have also said, Oh, if they could have just heard what these ears of mine have heard. Then maybe he thought about the Lord Jesus Christ standing there and saying in John chapter 10, I am the good shepherd. And in John chapter 6, I am the bread of life. And all those great I am sayings in John's gospel. Oh, if they could have just heard what the ears of John heard. If they could just see what the eyes of John saw. And the Holy Spirit whispers in John's ear. He says, John, there is a way. They can see what you saw and hear what you heard. Take up your pen and write down what I tell you to say, what you saw and what you heard, and John says, I'll do it. And he writes down this gospel. And he produced this gospel by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And this gospel is the antidote, the cure for dwindling faith. It shows us the glory of our Savior, Jesus Christ. So today, if you are in the pain and agony of dwindling faith, if you find your faith just kind of shriveling up and weaker and weaker than it's ever been, and you're just going through the motions, then I tell you to take up this old gospel of John, the apostle, and as you read it, be careful how you read it. Don't just read it like a daily Bible assignment or a duty. Well, I checked off that chapter, and I'm going to go on to the next one. I'll mark that off. No, not like that. You've got to read this like you've never seen this before, like you've never heard this before. And you'll see the wonder of it as John lays out who Jesus is before us and what is being told to him about Jesus. This glorious Jesus who came down from heaven to live among men to provide salvation, eternal salvation. So John wrote this as an antidote for dwindling faith. 
Folks, would you agree with me today that we need a deliberate and definite and powerful revival today? Would you agree? We need one. This is not maybe. We need one. There is so much dwindling faith today. How we need to see Jesus today. How we need to see the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. John's gospel is designed to help those Christians in his day, and it can help us as well. And that brings me to the basic division of the Gospel of John. Generally speaking, these divisions that we make, are we've adopted them for our own benefit to help us better understand what we're looking at and reading. So don't push those kinds of things too hard or they will break down on you. But as John and these other men wrote the Bible, I don't think they were thinking about point one and point two and point three, not like that. They were writing from their heart what they saw, what they heard, what they remembered, what they knew. And these things don't always divide themselves into nice, neat little categories. But there is a general division of John's gospel here. Chapters 1 through 12 present to us the public ministry of Jesus. And then chapters 13 through 21 present the private ministry. That's the basic division of John's gospel. You can see this in John chapter 13, if you'll turn back there for just a moment. Look at chapter 13, verse 1 where you see this kind of change coming. John 13, verse 1, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that His hour had come, that He should depart from this world to the Father, having loved His own who were in the world, He loved them to the end. This is Jesus moving into His private ministry with His disciples. There's this big shift there in chapter 13, verse 1, from the public ministry to the private ministry. The focus shifts here, to Jesus' love for His own. He says, He loved them to the end. Aren't you glad He loves you to the very end? Aren't you glad? He loved them to the very end. And as as He ministers to His own disciples here, and if you know what happens in John 13, we saw this before we talked about this, He washes their feet, and He tells them He must soon depart from them. And they're crushed with sorrow. And then he begins to speak to them these words that are so comforting in chapters 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17. And you you can find them all throughout those chapters. In chapter 14, he said he's going to the Father's house. Look at those words in chapter 14 again. He says in verse 1, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you we talked about that. What a comfort it is. Aren't you glad if you're sitting here saved, there's a place for you called the Father's house. Are you glad about that? I'm glad about that. He talks to them about the privilege of prayer, talking to God and about the ministry of the Holy Spirit. That's all in chapter 14. He talks to them about His peace. Go to chapter 14, verse 27. He says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Folks, if ever there was a day we need to hear this, it's today, is it not? People are afraid. You know this. They're living in fear, paralyzed by fear. Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled. I give you my peace. And all of these things are very comforting to us. Now, this 17th chapter of John's Gospel relates this precious prayer that Jesus prayed for these men and also a prayer that He prayed for all of us as believers. It is a marvelous, marvelous prayer. I think Jesus prayed this prayer somewhere between the upper room and the Garden of Gethsemane. Go back to John 14, just a moment, and look at verse 31. You'll see what I'm talking about. The last verse of John 14 but that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandments, so I do. Arise, here it is. He says, arise, let us go from here. They're in the upper room when He washes their feet, when they have the, the Lord's Supper. Arise, let's go from here. And shortly after that, I, I, I think the disciples left the upper room with Jesus, because there in chapter 18, if you go to John 18, verse 1, it says, when Jesus had spoken these words, He went out with His disciples over the brook Kidron, where there was a garden where His disciples entered. So between the upper room and the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus prays this prayer. Now you understand when He goes to the Garden of Gethsemane, He separates from all of them. He takes the inner circle, Peter, James, and John with Him, and He separates from them too, and He goes further into the garden, and He prays alone. He prays alone. But here He prayed this prayer in John chapter 17, somewhere between the upper room and the Garden of Gethsemane, and He prayed it in the hearing of the disciples so they could hear this. I would agree that this is the greatest prayer ever prayed. The greatest prayer ever prayed on earth. And this is the greatest prayer 
recorded anywhere in Scripture. I know people say, it, what about the Lord's Prayer? Well, folks, what you see here in John 17 is the true Lord's Prayer as He prays for His disciples. What you see in the Sermon on the Mount is the model prayer, how He teaches us how to pray. But the disciples are about to enter upon a stage of life and experience like they've never had before, one they never thought possible. They're about to enter upon sorrows like they've never known before and problems of major proportions, hostility and hatred pointed at them. What a comfort it must have been to these men to think about this prayer that Jesus prayed for them and remembering Jesus prayed for me. He prayed for me. On the way to the garden, they hear this prayer. I want to call your attention to three major divisions of this prayer to give you a basic understanding of it. We won't have time to get into all three parts of this today. We'll just get started. It's a very easy division. Here in the first five verses, the Lord Jesus Christ prays for Himself in John 17. He prays for Himself. And then in verses 6 through 19, He prays for those disciples who were with Him at that time. That's the second division, verses 6 through 19. And then in verses 20 through 26, Jesus prays for His disciples who will come to Him in the future. Verses 20 through 26, the disciples who will come in the future. Folks, this is thrilling whether you think so or not, whether it seems that way to you or not. All of us today who know the Lord Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior are in this prayer. Look at verse 20 of John 17. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. That's you and me if you're a believer today. That's you and me. Are you glad Jesus prays for you? Boy, I am. I am. I'm glad he prays for me. That word, these, says, I do not pray for these alone. Who are these? Well, that's the disciples who were with him here at the time. That He says, Father, these ones here that I have with me are going to preach my word, and they're going to be, and, though, and, and these are going to be those who, are, who, who come to me when they hear the word of God. That's always been the case, ladies and gentlemen. That's how this works. That's how Jesus set it up. These men preached the word, and, and, and there were those who came. And those who came preached the word, and there were more who came. And they began to preach the word, and there were more who came. And finally, it came down one glorious night when an old country preacher at a church youth camp near Johnsonville, Illinois, preached the word of God, and I came. Because God spoke to my heart that night. It absolutely thrills my heart to know that Jesus prayed for me. For me! Does it thrill your heart that He prayed for you? It thrills my heart that He prayed for me. That night as He makes His way to the Garden of Gethsemane with His disciples, He said, Father, I pray for all those who will come to me. So the last part of this prayer in verses 20 through 26 deals with Jesus praying for His disciples of all ages. Are you interested in what Jesus prayed for, ladies and gentlemen? Are you interested? Here's what it is. Then you need to read these verses with me here in John 17. This afternoon, just take the chapter 17 home with you. It's not very long. It won't take you long to read, 26 verses. And just read it again and again. And think of how this is praying for you, Jesus praying for you. Read these verses. It may, it may even shock you to see what Jesus considers to be most important. It's often very different from what we call the most important things in life. Look with me here in these opening verses, verses 1 through 5, and we'll have to come back in other sermons to these other verses. I, I want to divide verses 1 through 5 for you in three easy parts here. The first part is I want you to see that Jesus makes a statement here. He says, Father, the hour has come. There in verse 1, He lifted up His eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. The hour refers to the time of His death. That's what the hour means because He's been talking about that off and on throughout John's gospel, the hour, the hour, the hour. It's not my hour yet. So he makes a statement here. He says, the hour has come. And then he makes one petition, one request for himself. That's also in verse 1. Look at the last part of verse 1. Glorif Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. That's his request. That's his petition. Glorify your Son. That's his petition. Okay? I want us to look at what that petition means. Glorify your Son that He may glorify you. All the rest of those words in verses 2 through 5 basically flow out of that one request, that one petition. So there's really a two-part division here in these verses where Jesus prays for Himself, the statement and then the petition, the request. We'll look at that petition and request. But before we come to that petition, 
Uh, and, and I may not come to all of this today. I'm, I'm not sure I can get that far, but I have to say that there are so many marvelous things here in this prayer. As most of you know, one of the things that I labor at constantly as your pastor and as your brother in Christ, and sometimes even become exasperated about at this point, is to get the people of God to see the marvel of their salvation. Would you agree with me today, and I'm hoping you give a strong amen to this, that your salvation is marvelous? Would you agree? It's marvelous. This is not ho-hum, boring, no. This is marvelous. These are strange days, folks, because it seems like the more pastors labor at getting God's people to see the marvel of their salvation, the more bored people are. Oh, ho-hum. Oh, that's a yawner. Big deal. I'm saved. Folks, it is a big deal if you're saved. Is it not? It's a big deal. It's a sad day when we can handle the major truths of the gospel with a yawn and with boredom, we seem to have so many folks who are bored with Christianity today. This will shock you. A lot of folks, if you stop on the streets of St. Clair, Franklin County, ask them what heaven's going to be like. Oh, it's got to be one of the most boring places you can imagine, they think. Just floating around on a cloud, shining your halo, strumming your harp. Folks, that's not what heaven is. That's not what the Bible says heaven is. People get more excited about things that don't amount to anything than they do about the biggest things, the biggest things they could ever imagine. What a sad day it is. How many marvelous things are, are in this prayer anyway? Well, here's one of them. I will have time to show you just a few. Here's one of them. One of the marvelous things that we see in John 17 in this prayer Jesus begins here in verses 1 through 5 is that Jesus was here to pray this prayer. It's a marvel that He's even here to pray this prayer. What a marvelous thing that the Son of God should even be here to pray this prayer. Folks, I, I'm trying to say to you, Jesus did not have to come down here. You all understand that, right? He didn't have to come down here. We are all in sin and ruin and degradation and shame, and God would have been perfectly just to have said, you know what, I told those people what would happen if they disobeyed me, what was going to come their way, and they have disobeyed me. So as my judgment and my condemnation has come upon them, just like I said, you know what, I'm just going to leave them there in that condemnation and shame and degradation, and I'm done with them. Aren't you glad God didn't say that? But part of the marvel of our salvation is that even before the world began, even before there was a world or even before there was a sin, God decided that He would not leave sinners in their shame and in their degradation. He decided then and there in counsel with the other two members of the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, they decided that He would lift sinners out of their sin and shame. He would bring them out of their degradation and make it possible for them to know Him. Aren't you glad He made it possible for us to know Him? And there at the cross of Jesus, Christ was set in eternity before He ever came down to earth. Before there was ever a world... It was decided that the second person of the Trinity, God the Son, would come into this world, become one of us as humans. So here He is in John 17. It's a marvel that He's here at all to pray this prayer. Here's the second thing that's marvelous about this prayer. It's a marvel to me that Jesus prayed. First of all, it was a marvel that Jesus is here to pray this prayer, but it's a marvel, secondly, that Jesus prayed. Folks, here's the truth. If Jesus prays, you and I need to pray, don't we? If Jesus found it necessary to pray, how much more should His disciples, us, find it necessary to pray? It'll shock you, but here's the truth. Most people who call themselves Christians pray very, very, very little. Very little. I think one of the most impressive things to me about the Lord Jesus Christ is that He's a man of prayer. You see this throughout all the Bible. You see this in all four Gospels, but you see it especially in the Gospel of Luke. We're told that Jesus picked His disciples, but before He picks them, He prays there in Luke chapter 6, verse 12. We're told that Jesus got up before dawn, before the sun comes up, and He prays in Mark chapter 1, verse 35. We're told in Luke's Gospel that Jesus said that men ought always to pray and not to faint in Luke 18, verse 1. And here on the night before He's crucified, on the night before He goes to the cross, He's still praying. Folks, what does that say to us? Should we not still be praying? And He's not through praying, by the way, because he, He's about to go into the Garden of Gethsemane 
where He keeps praying there too, He's still praying. You follow Him to the cross, and when He's nailed to the cross, when they drive the nails through His hands and through His feet, and it's painfully dropped into that hole that they dug for the cross, and Jesus is lifted up there between heaven and earth as if He were fit for neither, There on the cross, what's the first thing that comes out of his mouth? The first thing he does is pray, and the first word out of his mouth is Father. Remember that? Father, forgive them. Remember that? First words. Some of us think that we have problems and trials. Some of us think that we have difficulties like no one else has ever had. But folks, let me tell you, the Lord Jesus Christ teaches us That no matter how difficult our circumstances are, no matter how heavy our burdens are, no matter how severe our trials are, Jesus tells us to keep on calling God Father. Call out to Him, Father, and keep calling. As Jesus suffers this agonizing death on a Roman cross, we can't even begin to imagine how hard this was. He's not angry at God. What does He say? He says, Father. He calls out to His Father. He's not angry or upset or complaining. How did this, you let this happen to me? He doesn't do that. If Jesus Christ could do that from the burning pain of Calvary, no matter what burdens you and I are facing this morning, we can still call God Father. Aren't you glad we can? If we're children of God, we can still call Him Father. Jesus teaches us to pray. It's a marvel that He's here at all. It's a marvel that He prayed. Jesus was a man of prayer. We should be people of prayer. Finally, this third marvel, and believe me, there's several here. These these aren't all of them. Here's the last one I want to give you this morning. Jesus comes here with the marvel of providing eternal life. Look at verse 2. As you have given Him authority over all flesh, that He should give eternal life to as many as you have given Him. Folks, He has come to give us eternal life. Isn't that marvelous? Marvelous. He gives eternal life to us. He says it there in verse 3. And this is eternal life. Here's what it is. That they may know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you have sent. That's what eternal life is. That they may know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Folks, you know people are following false gods today. You know that, right? They're following all kinds of false gods. And it surprises me just because some celebrity follows that. Well, we all should follow that. Folks, when was the last time a celebrity did anything for you? You think Tom Cruise cares about what I'm doing? Not a whit. And John Travolta too. They have no idea and they don't care. But folks, I don't follow John and Tom. You don't either, do you? You follow this one who gives eternal life. Jesus, not them. It's knowing God. That's what eternal life is. How's the old song go? When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing His praise than when we first begun. Right? Isn't that how it goes? That's how that goes. Isn't that amazing? We have fewer days upon this earth. Fewer days as the moments go by. Fewer days than we've ever had before. You are closer to death right now than you've ever been before as each second of the clock ticks off. I'm not telling you something you don't already know. You know this. Some of you are wide awake now. now, You you mean I'm about to die? I didn't say you're about to die. I said you're closer to death than you were just even 10 minutes ago. It gets your attention, doesn't it? I've been on this earth for 61 years now, and folks, I've got less days this morning than I've ever had in my life. I don't know when my life ends. God knows that. But when I've been in eternity, 61 million years, folks, I'll still have no less days to sing His praise than when I first began. How about you? That's how that goes. Now, folks, I don't know about you, but I'm interested in eternal life. That's a marvel to me. Life that never ends. Eternal life. It's a marvel to me that God would reach down into the muck and the mire of sin and pluck sinners out of it like me and like you and give them this precious, fabulous blessing of eternal life. Here in John 17, Jesus talks about how this eternal life is tied up together in three gifts that the Father gives the Son. Now, this is better than anything on television, I promise you. This is better than what the cardinals are going to do. Here it is. Look at me verse 3, verse 2. 
He says, as you have given him authority over all flesh. That's one gift. He's given authority over all flesh. And then also in verse 2, he says, to as many as you have given him. That means God's given him a people. He's given Jesus a people, as many as you've given him. Each of these before the world began, God gives to his son. As a love gift, he gives these things to him. God the Father says to God the Son, I'm going to give you as a gift, as a token, as an expression of my love. God the Son says, what gift are you going to give me, Father? And the Father says, I'm giving you a people for yourself. And by the time it's all said and done here, this people that I'm giving you will be completely conformed to be like you, unto your image. I'm going to make them just like you, son, to show you how much I love you. Now this is now into the area of infinities and immensities, the big things, the big stuff. If you're a child of God today, I want you to know that you were given by God the Father to God the Son even before the world began. That's how that goes. Someone says, well, pastor, I don't understand that. Oh, my brother or sister, I don't understand it either, but I believe it because it's in the Bible and that settles it, does it not? It's in the Bible. And I'll tell you what else, I don't just believe it, I rejoice in it. How about you? I rejoice in this. Well, I don't know, Brother Bill, you get pretty carried away up there. This is eternal life, ladies and gentlemen. I think we should be carried away, should we not? This is eternal life we're talking about. This marvelous thing of eternal life is all bound up in these gifts that God the Father gives God the Son. Now, there's a third gift here. But please don't rush by these first two gifts here. Do you realize what Jesus is saying to his disciples here when he prays this? He says, God the Father gave God the Son authority over all flesh there in verse 2. Authority over all flesh. That means that God the Son could have in his authority over all flesh said, you know what, I'm not going to provide salvation for a single one of those miserable sinners. They've all disobeyed me. They've all disrespected me. I'm not going to give him one thing. Folks, he had that authority over all flesh. As I said a while ago, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit would have been completely just had they not turned one tap, not lifted one finger by by way of providing salvation. They would have been just to do that because they're holy, perfect, and pure. And we are not those things, are we? We're not. You will never be happy that you're saved until you understand that God did not have to save you. He didn't have to. He could have put you in hell and been perfectly just. He could have put me in hell and been perfectly just. Most of us are not too happy about salvation because I think we figure out somehow that we basically deserve it. You know, I'm not such a bad guy, God. God didn't really have to do much to save a guy like me. After all, he's kind of lucky to have me, is he not? No, he's not. He's not lucky to have Bill Savage. He's not. You and I were miserable, hell-bound sinners. And God had to do this much. God had to send His Son in order to save us. Jesus could have said, Bill Savage, you know what? You perish. There's your future. You perish. But Jesus said, I'm going to come and redeem Bill Savage. And Bill Savage is going to be part of the people that I was given back there in eternity past. Some people try to put all this under the microscope and diagram all this and and dissect all this and take all this apart and try to figure this out. Maybe when they get all this figured out, maybe they can tackle the Trinity and maybe uh, figure that one out too. Folks, I don't understand the Trinity, do you? I don't. But you believe in the Trinity, don't you? You believe it. Why do you believe it? You believe it because it's in the Bible. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. No, my friends, I don't understand God giving me to God the Son before the world began, but it's in the Bible, and I believe it, and I'm so glad to be a part of this marvelous thing. Aren't you glad to be a part of it? If you're sitting here saved. Now, here's the third and final gift as part of this eternal life that he brings. He says he has authority over all flesh. He says he's given him a people to as many as you have given him, Here's the third gift. Look at verse 4. I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you've given me to do. Here's the third thing. God's given him a work to do, a work. Back there when God the Father gave God the Son authority over all flesh, 
And he gave God the Son a people for himself. He said, son, these people are going to have to be redeemed from their sin. That's the work I'm sending you to do. Redeem these people from their sin. And in order to redeem them from their sin, you're going to have to become one of them, son. You've got to become a human being. You've got to take on their humanity, have skin and bone, flesh and blood. And in that humanity, son, you're going to have to live a perfect life of obedience to me. And in that perfect humanity, you're going to have to go to Calvary's cross where they're going to put you up there, son, and they're going to put a sword in your side, a spear in your side, and nails in your hands, hands and feet, and the thorns on your head. They're going to beat the fire out of you, son. But you've got to offer yourself as a sacrifice for their sins. You're going to have to endure my wrath, son, against these people that I'm giving to you. Folks, that's the work our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ came to do. Aren't you glad He did it? Aren't you glad he did it? Here the night before he's crucified, there hadn't been a single nail driven into his hands yet. But that work on the cross was so sure, so so definite, so certain. Jesus was able to say, Father, you remember that work you gave me back there in eternity past? That work that you assigned me on behalf of these people you gave me? Father, I have finished the work. I finished it. And the very next day, just hours from this here in John 17, go to John 19. Look what our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ says in John 19, verse 30. Here's one of those great last words of Jesus from the cross, verse 19, or chapter 19, verse 30. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. It's finished. He's talking about that work the Father gave him to do. Oh, folks, this is a marvelous prayer. This is a marvelous prayer. It's a marvel that Jesus was here to pray this prayer. It's a marvel that He prayed this prayer at all. It's a marvel that He came to provide eternal life. And this eternal life is bound up in these three gifts. Now, I'm sure by this point, you're thinking He's not going to try to finish all of John 17 this morning, is He? No, He's not. We'd be done If we tried that this morning, we'd, done, we'd be done about midnight tonight. Folks, let me just tell you today that what Jesus Christ did for sinners here in John 17, He did for whosoever will. Whosoever will. I'm glad that's in the Bible, aren't you? I'm glad that's in there. Whosoever will, let Him come, the Bible says. And if you want this eternal life that we're talking about here, don't you fret over whether you were given by God the Father to God the Son back through eternity past. If you want eternal life, I'm telling you right now to make a beeline to Jesus Christ because that's where the eternal life is. It's with Jesus. And wrap both your arms around Him and rest in Jesus. You will never perish clinging to Jesus. In order for you to perish clinging to Jesus, Jesus Himself would have to perish. And we know this, folks. He came back from the dead, did He not? He did not stay dead. If you don't have eternal life today, if you're not a Christian, run to Jesus. Run to Jesus. Run to Jesus and take Him and say, Oh, Christ, what you did on Calvary's cross, I want it to count for me. I want it to count. God says, whoever, whosoever comes to me, I'm not going to cast him out back there in John 6. Then if you are a child of God today, let me close with this. I'd like for you to just, uh, just stretch a little bit, maybe flex a little bit, and rejoice. Oh, rejoice. Did you all hear that? Rejoice! Rejoice! It scares you when a preacher raises his voice, doesn't it? <laughs> Somebody hits a ball over the wall, we get excited. Somebody catches a touchdown pass. Someone slam dunks a basketball. 50,000 people jump up and scream. Woo! But we don't get excited about this. Folks, what has Jesus done for us here? Let a preacher raise his voice. Everybody says, well, what's, what's he doing? I'm going to say it again. Rejoice! Amen. Rejoice in this. Rejoice. If you're saved today, rejoice, my brother, my sister, rejoice. God did not have to do this for you. He did not have to. He didn't have to desire your salvation. He didn't have to come down here and send His Son. But oh, rejoice. He did. He did rejoice. And I'm saved today by virtue of the fact of what God did in and through His Son, Jesus Christ. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ says, Bill Savage, there's something I want you to do for me. Let me say this before we go even a second further. Let me tell you what my heart is. I'm not perfect, folks. I'm not. 
I am so far from it, it scares me. But my heart is this. I, if, if I can serve this Savior who came from heaven's glory, I'm going to serve Him. How about you? He came down from heaven's glory to save a sinner like me. I'm going to serve Him when I'm tired. I'm going to serve Him when I'm broke. I'm going to serve Him when other people misunderstand me. I'm going to serve Him when other people offend me. I'm going to serve Him when nobody else serves Him if it comes down to that. Because He came from heaven's glory in order to purchase my salvation. When He says to me, My child given to me in eternity past, I want you to serve me. My heart says, Oh, Jesus, what do you want me to do? Show me what you want me to do. And in my imperfect way, I want to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a marvelous prayer. These are marvelous things. Amen? Let's bow and pray. Father, we thank You today for this marvelous, marvelous prayer. This is a marvelous prayer, Jesus. And we would expect nothing less than marvelous from You because You are marvelous in every way. You are perfect in every way. Every thought you ever had, every word you ever spoke, everything you ever did, every moment, every attitude, every affection, every feeling, everything about you is perfect because you are God and God is perfect. And so we would not expect anything less than a perfect prayer from you. And we thank you for this. Thank you for inspiring John to write this down. This way you pray for us the way you pray for your disciples then, your disciples now, how you prayed for yourself for God to glorify you so that you could glorify God. Even though you knew what was coming in a matter of hours, you, you sought to glorify the Father. May we do the same here this morning, God. Now, if there's someone here, some man, some woman, some boy, some girl, who's never run to you, they've run from you. If they've never run to you, dear Jesus, would you speak to them now? Please, would you use the powerful all-powerful Holy Spirit that you are to draw them to you, away from their sin and to you. Would you help them to see that they need you? Without you, they're doomed. Without you, they are headed straight for hell. There is no escape without you. You are the only way to avoid that, Jesus. The only way. And we pray that each one here has trusted that. If they haven't, as we sing to you in just a moment, would you help us to give ourselves to you and seek you. And for those of us that have trusted you, that have been so wonderfully blessed to be saved by your grace and salvation, would you help us to do what we said a moment ago, to rejoice, to rejoice in this. Not be griping and complaining and barking and biting, snapping at one another, none of that, but to rejoice in Jesus. And we ask all this in your name, Almighty Son of God, our Lord and Savior. Amen.